And you mentioned the Beatles a lot. I'm surprised you haven't mentioned the Stones because I would have thought oh, they yeah. would have been bigger. Well, I was always big very big contemptuous of Mick's singing, right. but um, he was a great harmonica. Mick, we mm. we met them all in. Um, there was a gig at the. It was either the Town Hall or the Odeon in Birmingham. Anyway, I can't remember now which one it was. Um, oh yes, it must have been the Odeon because it was right around the corner from the hotel we went to afterwards. And they were they were on with um, oh my God they were on with Little Richard, uh, Bo Diddley, I think the Everly Brothers as well. Um, the package shows we used to have in those days. The Everly Brothers were huge at that point as well. Weren't they? Oh yeah, yeah they were. Yeah. Um, and um, we we got quite friendly with um, two or three of the Stones. Uh, Brian in particular surprised me. He um, he said, "Oh, that's right. The reason we got the invite to the party was they all got to the Albany Hotel. We were home, you know, um, after the gig, and I got a call from Alan Stinson, who was a, a, a journalist on the Record Mirror in those days. I think it was the Record Mirror, and um, he needed me to bring a, a, a record player and some records because they they didn't have one with them." And uh, I had a huge radiogram, so I said, yeah, OK. Uh, I said, because we'll, we'll, my friend Bo, he, he and his brother had got this Dan Set type um, thing. I've got one of them at home. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> so um, he, uh, we, we, we took that. They said they'd send a taxi for me. And the taxi was um, uh, chauffeured, not, not chauffeured, uh, accompanied, um, was a huge black gangster fellow who turned out to be Jerome. He, he was the maracas shaker for uh, Bo Diddley's band. Uh, he was the wife of um, the Duchess, they used to call her, who played um, bass for Bo Diddley. God, she was gorgeous. She was about six foot two. And we just, I almost fainted when she came out. <laughs> How are you doing, y'all? <laughs> I'd never seen anything like her. And I literally did feel very faint for, for a few seconds. Anyway, he came up to the house. And of course I had to admit that it wasn't my record player we were going to take. I took a bundle of records. We had to go up to Bo's house. And <laughs> Bo's record player wasn't working so we had to <laughs> pick up Bo and his brother. Then we ran around to Dennis's and we got his um, his record player. We're going to a party with the Rolling Stones. Oh, Has anybody yeah. got a working record player? I tell you what, um, <laughs> by the time we, we got Dennis into the car, uh, Jerome was rumbling to himself, you know, in the back seats, and he took up most of the back seats. He was like a black duvet, you know, he was everywhere. <laughs> so anyway, when we got to the party, um, we, we were playing all, all the John Lee Hooker and Jimmy Reed records we'd taken, and Brian said to me, you know, our harmonica player knows every single solo in every single Jimmy Reed record, and I thought, hang about what do you mean, our harmonica player? I thought you were our harmonica player, but Brian always thought it was his band, as you now know. But in those days, it came as something of a revelation to me. I had no idea that um, that he thought it was his band. Um, certainly, but he wasn't. did start. It, no, no, he did. I think in his early days, he did with Alexis Corner. I think he got the first sort of did he? moves in there. I think so. He was come from Cheltenham as well, which makes him a Midlands boy as well. Isn't it? <sighs> Sort of, sound yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think in the early days he was the mover and shake. I've read all the bi yeah. Stone's biographies and things. Um, but I think um, as time went on it became Keith Richards and Mick Jagger because they started writing all the songs. Didn't mm. it? But I think, he had, I think he was the one, he was the big blues fanatic in the early days. Yes, he was. I think, um, I think Mick and Keith were more rock and roll because they used to yeah. meet with Chuck Berry records and things. Well, they? yes, but well, I mean, we were all still rock and roll. The Muddy yeah. Waters people, we, we were all rock and roll. Yeah. We were still love Chuck Berry. Yeah. Chuck, really, Chuck brought everything together. Mm. The way uh, later on Jimi Hendrix did, you know, he, he got the blues and made all kinds yeah. of stuff out of it. Uh, and, and then Bob Dylan, he, he did the same thing. He, I think, um, Chuck and Bob Dylan and Robert Johnson, the, between them, they would take other people's songs and make a damn sight better version than those other people did. You know, practically everything Chuck Berry ever did was much better than his influences. And of course, Robert Johnson, he was he was the, the genius of the blues. If you yeah, ask was me, was his story still uh, well known at that point, or was that legend? Did that come later? 
about his meeting with the devil at the crossroads and all this sort of thing. Was well, that, we, were people aware of that then, or did that come a bit later, do you think? If, if you knew singers like Tommy Johnson, who also did the, the crossroads thing, uh, ha had it said about him, you know, that the devil Legba, his name is, um, tuned his guitar for him at the crossroads. What you had to do, you had to sit here, then Legba would loom over you and tune your guitar from behind. It was never made clear how he, how he managed that, by the way. But anyway, that's how it worked. And, um, and, and then when he, um, when he finished tuning, he would disappear with, with your soul in his, in his pocket or whether, wherever you'd keep those things. And, and then that would, that would make you a musical genius. And all, quite a few of the blues men said the same thing, you know. That Legba had done it for them. I can't take you out of a Rolling Stones party, though. So where were? Ah, oh, okay. Well, you um, managed to find a working record player. Yes, Dennis is. <laughs> it was the Albany Hotel, and and we 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 had a really good time there. The party went on until about uh, two or three in the morning, and then we we were telling, um, I was telling uh, Brian, and uh, I think it was, I think it was Bill. Three of them walked home with us anyway. Mick was out of it right the way through. I never, I never met him. Uh, he, he, he was lying down with his face in his girlfriend's lap uh, um, after, the, after the gig. He was completely out. The other... Oh, um, Ian Stewart, was it? The, yeah, the road manager. Yes. I congratulated him when I found out yeah. what a great piano player yeah. he was. Um, so... Mick offended me, the fact that he'd got the ideal band, the band that I really deserved, you know. He was the only, he was the only pop singer who was doing that stuff, right. who couldn't sing as well as I could. Practically everybody else was better than me, but he wasn't, he was crap. I always disliked him for that. <laughs> so I started talking about Steve Winwood, whom no one knew yet in those right. days. We, Steve Winwood and his gang, the Spencer Davis gang, they yeah. um, opened the first Blues, Rhythm and Blues Club in Birmingham in early 63. So I talked about this fellow, what a genius he was, and I said to uh, Brian, y you need to kick your, kick your singer out, he's no good. Good harmonica player, but he's no bloody good at singing. And, and he's a bit of a popping jay anyway. I probably didn't use that word then, but <laughs> that's what I meant. And he was quite interested in this, and he asked me to take him up to the, uh, the, the Golden Eagle at the top of Hill Street. That's just before you get to the town hall, you know, there in Birmingham. Uh, and we, we were going to meet them, you know, they were going to, when they got a Monday night off, um, he and maybe one or two of the other Stones were going to come up and, um, and have a look, see what they thought of the place. Because blues clubs then were very, very rare. They had them in London, but they didn't have them anywhere else. But it never happened. And then a little a bit, little bit later on, they found Brian drowned in a pool. I've often wondered who did that. <laughs> if it's anything to do with me, I'm sure it's not. I'm sure <laughs> So then, moving on a little bit further then, mm. when the big um, rhythm and blues boom came in, you just thought you'd died and gone to heaven and been yes, in exactly the yes, right I place did. at the right time. Do you know, rhythm and blues was pop for a short time. Mm. And I had to admit in the end that Mick was okay, because he did a damn good version of uh, Little Red Brewster, and he took that Howling Wolf song to the top of our charts. Mm. Wolf, I'm sure, he, he, he would never have believed that such a thing could happen. But it did. Mm. Um, and it was the first blues record we ever had in uh, in the British charts, I think. Unless you count Bad Penny Blues, the Chris Barber instrumental, um, with that left-hand boogie roll-in thing that um, Paul uh, liked, and, and he got the same pianist to do it in Lady Madonna a little later. But that was a, that was a beauty. 